Father, we come before you this morning and we want to thank you for your goodness and your mercy that endureth forever. We thank as we come boldly to the throne of grace to obtain that mercy and grace. We're assured by your word that it will be deposited, injected in us, Lord God. And we thank you that you're here to strengthen each and every one of us. We thank you. You have a word of life. You have a word of hope. And you have a supply of the Holy Ghost. And we're thanking you now in Jesus' name. And everyone said... And we say, live in the dream. Live in the dream. One more time, live in the dream. You know, living God's dream will be impossible if we did not have a supply that came from God through prayer. Can I have an amen? In fact, in the book of Philippians, it says, For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance. Through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Say, the supply. Say, I need some supply. Then uh, James, you can hear the same, the th same theme in James chapter 5. Very familiar verse of scripture. It says, that the earnest, heartfelt, continued prayer of the righteous man makes tremendous power available, dynamic in its working. Now notice this. Without prayer, there is no tremendous power available, dynamic, in its working. So the tremendous power available is keyed in on prayer. Say prayer, prayer. makes tremendous power <clears throat> available to all my situations in the name of Jesus. Now Jesus relied on this kind of power. He relied on, of course, he had a relationship with his father, but he often prayed. He prayed for direction. He prayed for, of course, as a father would speak to him because he often said, I will not do a thing that my father hasn't told me to do or say something that my father hasn't told me to say. But there was a situation in the Garden of Eden. It's not the Garden of Eden. In the Garden of Gethsemane. And I want to read that passage to you because there's something that's, that's unlocked for us as believers. As Davin uh, just said, that we started 24-hour prayer. Amen. I mean, that's, that's people believing that you're going to have the greatest breakthrough, not only for the people that you're praying for, but also for your own personal life. I mean, you know, God's interested in your own personal life. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it says in verse uh, 36 of Matthew 26, Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to the disciples, Sit here while I go to pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. And he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. Verse 39. He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Verse 40, then he came to his, the disciples the first time. Say the first time. And he found them sleeping and said to Peter, what, could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Say, oh my. Yeah, that's right. Verse 40, uh, 42 says, again, a second time he went away and prayed, saying, oh my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me, uh, sorry, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. Verse 43. And he came and found them asleep again a second time. Say a second time. For their eyes were heavy. Verse 44 it says, and he left them, went away again and prayed a third time, saying the same words. Verse 45. Then he came to his disciples and said to them the third time, say the third time. Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand. The Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of, sin of sinners. Rise, let us be going. My betrayer is at hand. Of course, you all know this is a story where Judas and the Roman centurions came in. And right before uh, he was led to all the religious leaders and he was um, accused of all those things. But anyways, I want to just take it right here, and I want you to realize what Jesus is saying to the sons of thunder, Peter, James, and John. He's talking to them, and he's, he's ministering to them 
and he's, he's called his three to be along his side. I said, I want you to watch and pray. You know, he's asking him to pray as well. I said, I want you to watch, but there's something heavy going on, and you all don't understand it, but I need, you, I just need your support. Now, they knew all about prayer now because they had seen Jesus, you know, with him for, I mean, the length of his ministry as they've been exposed to it. They saw the power of prayer. They understand how Jesus prayed. They understand, uh, you know, knew a few, th a few things about praying as Jesus has already taught them in a few ways. And then three times he came to them and they were sleeping or at least they were drowsy or they had their eyes closed. You know, it's kind of like the church today. The church is sleepy. They have their eye closed and don't even know what's going on. They have no, have no idea sometimes of what's going on and it's going on all around them. And see, Jesus referred to their sleeping as their flesh being weak. Their spirit being strong, but their flesh being weak. And Jesus said it very, very clearly, you know, and I think he said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And this is what you need to understand when it comes to spiritual things following God. Your flesh cannot dictate your life. But people allow their flesh to dictate their spirituality. It's amazing. Say, not this house. <laughs> I'm serious. You know, and it's amazing how people let their body, their emotions, their circumstances dictate how they're going to live for God. So your neighbor says, not me, but I'm ready to pray for you if you need it. Anyways, it's important that you and I understand these things. But you know what's really going on here? Jesus speaks to them three times. This is no, no, no accident that just happened. Truly it happened, but it's a truth that you and I need to embrace. That you cannot listen to your flesh, not listen to your body, listen even to your own mind. We've got to trust God with all of our heart, lean not to our own understanding. Trust God with all of our heart and let him direct us. Amen? It's important that you and I understand this because really what's going on here is not just a natural thing. I mean, they didn't, have, they didn't have like the, you know, the graveyard shift and therefore they didn't get enough sleep. They weren't up doing a late project for Jesus, you know, for the little kids down the road and therefore they didn't get enough sleep. No, 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 no. This is spiritual. Espiritual. For those of you who only understand Spanish, the language of heaven. Anyways, you need to understand it's a spiritual battle. And there's reasons why you don't pray or reasons why the church doesn't pray. And I'm talking about the church in general. There's reasons why we can come up with so many reasons and so many excuses and become so logical and completely unspiritual. We become satisfied. I said the other night under prayer, we become satisfied with our potential. We talk about our potential. We talk about what the church can do one day, will be one day, but never is today. It's always about what we can do. We kind of have a bulge about us, but we never break through. And I'm here to tell you that until we begin to do, make those quality decisions to become the kind of disciple that Jesus wants us to be, uh, even though it's there, even though the promise is there, and God says, if you'll follow me, you'll break through. We just never break through because we don't want to break loose of our flesh. Turn to your neighbor and say, oh, my, 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 my. Anyways, um... It's important that you and I understand. If the enemy can distract the church from what matters most, then the church will be completely satisfied with what matters least. And that's why I've said never let what matters most be at the mercy of what matters least. And yet the church, oh, they are just busy, 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 busy. I mean, doing things that and barely having enough time, barely having enough time for Jesus. You know, and I want you to understand, therefore, there's no supply, there's no power. Everything that's going on is a dependency on their natural ability and their natural talent. And you all know we ain't all that together. Well, three of you do. Anyways, so remember what Jesus said, not praying one hour. You said, well, one hour. Listen, when you say one hour, that's your, that's your natural side talking. You know, you are so scheduled out that you can't schedule Jesus in. And I want you to understand, if anything in the church is going to shift, it's because you're going to make the decision. Not someone else is going to make it for you. You're going to make the decision. Say, I can do that. One person, one person can make the difference. Say, I can make a difference. And you need to understand, Jesus came up to him, and he just was just straight out with them. But he wasn't condemning them. He was letting them know 
you know, a lesson because they were about ready to take over the reins, you know, in a couple of years from this. So he's giving them, he's telling his disciples how to walk in the spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. How to walk in the spirit. The spiritual mind is, is very important to have. You've got to be spiritually minded. You know, it doesn't mean you have to be a theologian. It doesn't mean you have to break down every verse. By no means. By no means. You just, every person in here, if you're born again, you can be sensitive to the Holy Ghost. He will lead you. He will guide you. Listen, he already wants you to profit, right? The Bible says he's the Holy One of Israel. He's the Holy One of Israel. He's the Lord God Almighty. And he will teach you how to profit and lead you in the way in which we, you, you should go. When you don't pray, you're not going to be sensitive to the promptings of the Holy Ghost. You're not going to be sensitive to the directions. You're going to try to do it according to your experience, and you'll miss God by a mile. And even though you go to church and say, Jesus, I love you, because I'm here to tell you, you got to be, you got to be led by the Spirit of God. Those sons and daughters that are born of the Spirit need to understand, as it says in Romans chapter 8, to be led by the Spirit. Say, I will be led by the Spirit of God. So Jesus says to his own disciples, in verse 40, again, he says, <clears throat> Then he came to his disciples and, said, and saw them sleeping and said to El Pedro, he said, What, could you not pray, or, sorry, could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. So this is giving you an insight that if we don't, you know, up our game in terms of being prayerful, you know, I'm not becoming a law to any person. I mean, if you're getting caught up in the law, that's probably just your mind arguing with you anyway. I mean, if you can't pray an hour, you know, you're not going to be very strong. You say, well, you shouldn't say that, Pastor Art. Just give me some sugar. Don't have enough to pass around. Listen, I want you to understand. It says, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. You're going to try to change this and say, oh, I'm not under the law. I'm not under the law. I'm under grace. No, you're a fool is what you are. Because it says right here, Jesus is instructing us, and we want to change the game. Well, I, you know, I just want to start with five minutes a day. Well, that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, "Why? <laughs> look at all y'all. Y'all staring at me like a dog when you bone. Anyways, he says, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. I know I don't want to enter into temptation. But the temptations, you know, it's not so much a, a lustful thing, a, a sinful, immoral thing. It can be temptations to make the wrong decisions on a business. It could be temptations to make wrong decisions on a relationship. It can be uh, temptations to make wrong decisions in, in spiritual matters, as well as natural matters, as well as family matters, as well as your children matters. You cannot by yourself be successful without the Spirit of God. If it were so, then why would God send the Holy Ghost after all that he did so that you can have the advantage? You and I have the advantage. We have the power of the Holy Ghost. We have the name of Jesus Christ. We have the blood of Jesus Christ. We have the power of Calvary. We have his word. Brother and sister, we got everything going for us, and we don't want to take advantage of it. And I'm here to tell you, because you're in a, you're in a battle. Say, I'm in a battle. And you are in a battle. You say, I don't see it. Yeah, because you're numb. But you're in a battle. I don't care who you are in this room. I don't care how high you are, how low you are, whether you just got in, you, you've been born again for 30 seconds or 30 years. You know, I want you to understand, you're in a battle. That's why Paul said, the weapons of my warfare are not carnal, but the mighty through God for the pulling down the strongholds. Though I walk in the flesh, I do not war after the flesh. You see, there is a war that's going on. The enemy wants to control your flesh. Some of you are controlled by your flesh. You're dominated by your feelings. You're dominated by your mind. You're dominated by your experiences. It's your understanding of things, even your understanding of Jesus. You want to box Jesus in in a little comfort zone as long as it's, you know, because you do something out of convenience and out of preference versus out of power and out of direction. And I want you to understand it's important. That's why the Bible says, trust the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. You all got to figure out that we just don't have it all together. And when you lean on the Holy Ghost, that's why he's here to lead you and to guide you. Say, I want to be led. Come on, give Jesus a great big hand clap right now. Amen. And so, so in the, I, I believe it's the message translation, it reads this way. And he's talking, same passage, verse 40 and 41. He says, can't you stick it out with me a single hour? 
Stay alert. Be in prayer so you don't wander into temptation without even knowing you're in danger. There is a part of you that is eager, ready for anything in God. But there's another part that's as lazy as an old dog sleeping by the fire. <laughs> woof, woof. Anyways, come on, somebody. I don't know where that came from. That was not prophetic. Um, <laughs> The, the other day, uh, Kelly Copeland, Brother Copeland was here, and Kelly Copeland gave my girls, with Pastor Kuna and Gloria Copeland was there, gave them a word just like that. We, they began to talk about our event that was going on, the prayer three wall, and suddenly um, uh, um, Kelly um, hanged with this word, and Alexis recorded it, and then she gave me a copy of it, and it goes like this. There is something in my spirit that I have to share with you all. I feel the Spirit saying, watch for distractions. Now, some of you don't think I'm talking to you, but I'm talking to every one of you. Something is coming, but address it as a distraction. Relationally, physically, in your body, something out of nowhere that comes up that makes things so hard seemingly, like this hard wall, because she was pointing to a wall. So when that happens, just treat it as the distraction it is and say, no, in the name of Jesus, no weapon formed against me shall prosper and come against it. This distraction, this distraction, this is a, sorry, this is a distraction in Jesus' name. And I plead the blood against it. I plead the blood over it and everything I do. And then you just keep on walking forward. Don't nurse it. Don't feed it. Don't give it attention. Speak in authority and say no and just keep moving forward, says the Spirit of God. That's what Kelly Copeland gave to this house. And I want you to realize um, that distractions come because the enemy doesn't want you to get engaged in your assignment. The assignment you have, in part, is to maintain your spiritual health. Amen? And so the other day... So what can we do? The other day, we were talking about some, some situations, and in our, uh, I guess if it's called a week of fire, and we were coming up with something. The Spirit of God put something on my heart that I'd like to share with you, because it's easy to get distracted in the church. It's easy to get your eyes on flesh and blood. It's easy to get your eyes distracted on everybody that's not doing anything right including yourself, but you can't see it because you're distracted. And the enemy wants you to point your finger at everyone else who doesn't do this right, doesn't do that right. Is that the cynical spirit, you know, that sometimes, well, that's a cynical spirit that sometimes creeps into the church, and it calls itself spiritual. It's not spiritual. It's demonic. And I want to talk to you about that for just a second. In Numbers 16 chapter, this is, um, we're going to pick it up there from the NIV translation. And here, this is an amazing story because it talks about Moses and Aaron. And God's going to raise up some Aaron's in this house. Amen? And I'll explain what I mean by that in just a second. He represents the priesthood. Say, I'm, I'm a king and priest in Christ Jesus. But that was weak. Say, I'm a king and priest in Christ Jesus. Y'all don't even know what to do with that. So, and anyways, but I'll help you. And it's important that you and I understand. So he just got through taking them through all kinds of miracles. I mean, extreme miracles, signs and wonders. And I mean, the splitting of the Red Sea, the whole story is right there. Then all of a sudden, you get some, some people as well as leaders that begin to grumble and oppose the leadership. Anytime you oppose leadership, you're coming against God. You might not think you are because you think you're justified because you said they're just human. Yeah, but they're appointed humans. And you ought to understand the difference between you being you and a person being appointed. A person being called and anointed, and there's an office that if you don't respect it, you take something off of you. Well, anyways, I'm just throwing that your way. You're going to get it anyway. See, it says right here, and this is what happens in the church. This is what happens in the body of Christ in general, not just in this church, but in, uh, certainly in this church, but uh, in general in the body of Christ. And there's a reason why this happens. You know, when you got too much time on your hands to complain and gripe about other people, you're definitely not doing the Great Commission. 
You know, when you got too much time to be cynical, to be critical, to be judgmental of anything, you got to ask yourself, why am I spending my mental time doing all of that? What am I doing to help my own self with that time? You know, you ought to turn that time around because nobody needs your cynical attitude, especially when not, you're not that devoted. Turn your neighbor and say, I, I, I know he's not talking about me, but I am ready to lay hands on you. I, I'm, I'm, I'm willing anyways. And so... It says here, so this, these stories are coming, and all of a sudden, of course, right before this, uh, the sons of the tribe of Korah got swallowed up by the ground because they were so rebellious. They constantly came against Aaron and constantly came against uh, Moses, and finally, God just did a supernatural miracle. Be careful. The ground, the ground starts shaking. It might open up. Anyways, I'm just saying that, uh, so that happened. And then, as if Moses did it, they began to complain. They begin to complain against Moses. They begin to complain against, you know, Moses' um, orator, you know, Aaron. And this is what it says in verse 41. And the next day, the whole Israelite community grumbled. Ever heard of a grumble? Maybe it's been you. Maybe it's been someone next to you. Maybe it's been someone you know. Just keep looking forward like you don't know who I'm talking about. Anyways, and the community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. Have you ever grumbled against the Moses and Aaron? I don't like the way parents do my dresses. I don't like the way. <laughs> I don't like what he's asking me to do. He's wanting to be more spiritual than I want to be. I don't want to be spiritual. I want to be carnal. I want to be natural. I want to be who I am. Verse 42 says, and when all the assembly gathered in opposition, say opposition. Uh, to Moses and Aaron, you know, sometimes people think that because they're a majority, that they're correct. Majority does not always rule, you know. God is the one who rules. <laughs> and it says, but um, the assembly gathered in opposition to Moses and Aaron and turned toward the tent of the meeting. And suddenly the cloud. Come on, anybody, when you start opposing God's leadership, I mean, you know, I wouldn't say that Moses and Aaron were perfect by any stretch of the imagination. Moses definitely had his weaknesses and his own character. In fact, he had even a little self-doubt about what he can do and what he can carry out. And so there might be other issues, but um, those are definitely pointed out in the Bible. He felt he had, he had a stuttering problem. He felt he couldn't speak and so forth and so on. That's why Aaron was there. And so, um, but God got upset with Moses at one point. He says, you know, anyways. And so, so he had some weaknesses. And who knows, there were some others. And, you know, sometimes you get too familiar with people around you. Like you can get too familiar with your spouse. You can get too familiar with your children. And you drop the mantle for leading them. You, you, you get too familiar with church. And you lose sight of the Great Commission, what's really important. We begin to do the things that matter least instead of the things that matter most. And yet everybody wants the, the greatest position, but they want to do the, le the less activity to get there. Anyways... And so the cloud rolls in. Now, you don't want a cloud to roll in on you when you're complaining. When the cloud rolls in and you're the one complaining, something's about ready to happen. Anyways, and it says right here, and it, covered, and it covered it, and the glory of the Lord appeared. And Moses and Aaron went to the front of the tent meeting, verse 44, and the Lord said to Moses, get away from this assembly so I can put an end to them at once. I'm telling you. Shish kebab, right here. Anyways, and they, and they, Moses and Aaron, fell face down. They would say fell face down. Now, I, I believe truly, I mean, I'm going to give you this commentary. I believe truly it was out of reverence that they fell down. But I think, and, um, but it wasn't reverence because it was a time to worship. You know, the glory of the Lord came in, and, but the voice of God had spoken. It was reverence, but it was Reverence, therefore, it was out of intercession. They fell down. Moses was an intercessor. He was one that would often stand between the gap between God, God's throne, God's will, and the people who were far from being perfect. And you need to understand the people that we're praying for, ourselves alone, we need to constantly remind ourselves that we are here because of his grace and because of his mercy, not because of your great performance and your great talent. You know, I applaud you for your achievements, but you must remember who gave you the ability to achieve. And anytime you try to take credit for yourself, you're setting yourself up for a downfall. Say, I'm not going to do that. 
And so Moses fell face down, and he began to worship. Now, here's a great leader, and before all the people, in the midst of, you know, you're hearing at the same time the complaining and the, the griping and the revolting that's going on and the rebellion sounds and all of that. And the man of God falls on his face, and he begins to pray for the imperfect. But see, that's what the Bible talks about in the book of, what is it, um, Job chapter 22, verse 30, somewhere in there. It says that you can pray for those who are not innocent, and I will deliver them because of the purity of your hands. And I want you to realize that God looks for pure hearts like yours, so you and I can stand in the gap and get a hold of God's throne and and. You know, pray for people who might be addicted and twisted, and messed up and tore up from the floor up. You know, not living right. You know, being vile in their actions. And God says, don't put your eyes on that. you got to put your eyes on my will for their life. Don't condemn them. Don't judge them. They don't even know who I am. They can't tell God's voice. They're troubled. They're hurting. They're they're unstable in so many ways and the last thing you need to do is to become the judge to go over there and start judging them and criticizing them for a power they don't even know about I mean the power of God to set them free but that's why you and I become the inner citizens. come on somebody give the Lord a great big hand clap and I want you to see this because God is wanting people like this this is why God's asking us could you not pray with me one hour you know, not only to keep you out of temptation, but you and I can break the temptation off of other people. You have to come to the point where you understand and you believe. And this is only going to be by the grace of God, because by the grace of God, we are who we are. Amen? Like Paul said. And we're going to lean, we're going to take our faith and lean in that grace and believe everything that God said we are, that's who we are. Believe everything that he said we have, we have. And believe everything that he said we possess, we possess. We have to come to that place where you pass that veil and you say, I am what God says I am. I can do what God says I can do. And this is time, my time to do it. Amen. Give the Lord a great big hand clap right there. Mm. But I want you to hear this. He falls on his face. And here is this pure Moses who's praying for the imperfect. When was the last time you prayed for the imperfect? When was the last time you prayed for the weak? When was the last time you prayed for the person that jacked you up, bothered you? You know, and this is the only way you and I can do this is if we allow God to give us his compassion. And say, God, see, compassion doesn't come on you because you're this great-natured personality kind of person. It's not your makeup. No one you know, outside of being in Christ, has the ability to carry a, a, a compassion capacity that will make a difference in a person's life. It takes the power of God. It takes that power. In our church today, if we're ever going to see the Great Commission restored, if we're ever going to see God do something in our lives, we must come to this place where we say, God, we need to be baptized by the power of your spirit. Not that you haven't received the infinite of the Holy Spirit, but I mean a fresh with a, with a, with a power and with a love for people. Amen? And it says right here, and I love this, when he was face down and he was interceding and he was praying as well as reverencing God, there God gave him direction. Say direction. He gave him a word, and he, and, he, and he looks up, and he sits, and he said this to Aaron. He says, then Moses said to Aaron, take your censer. I love this. Take your censer, put incense in it, along with the fire from the altar, and hurry. Now he's talking to Aaron, all right? He says, hurry. That refers to urgency, not anxiousness, but urgency. He says, uh, to the assembly, or in other words, to the people, and make atonement. Atonement means, you know, to cover over. It also means to make uh, reparation or repair or to fix the damage. He's saying, Aaron, you got to do something, Aaron. And he's, but he already told him what to do. Take your censer. Now, the censer for us would be like a symbolic of our hearts. When a censer that's supposed to carry the fire doesn't have the fire, then there's something that's missing in a Christian's life. When a believer has no passion for the things of God, no passion for spiritual um, uh, insight, no passion to pray, no passion, you know, and God becomes a trivial matter. God becomes the option. I mean, any call can get you off the track. Any, you know, invitation anywhere will get you here over there. You know, someone sets up a golf game on your Sunday morning, and there you are because you have no passion for God. Oh, you can't judge me, but I just did. Anyways, I want you to understand 
you know, the thing is, is no, you say, I can't judge your heart, but I can judge your actions because your, judge, your actions already judge you. You see, it's not I that judge you. It's your actions that give evidence of how people see you, and they know your priorities by how you live. Anyways, turn your neighbor and say, I'm ready to pray. Just ask me. Anyways, it says here, take your censor. Imagine you being a believer, and there's a need right now in, in, uh, in, in, our, in, our, well, in our church for sure, in our society for sure, but we don't have any desire to do anything about it, or we say we don't know what to do about it. The first place you got to start is you got to go to the altar. Say the altar. Because in that altar is where you go and you surrender. It's in that altar that you go say, here I am, Lord. I don't know what you can do with me. I know I'm only one. I know I've been assigned to do this. But I really don't know how you're going to stop. See, because the plague had already started. Their griping and their complaining was killing them. Literally, they were dying. So, so many times people don't even realize that the griping, the complaining, the cynicism, the criticism, the backbiting, the, the envying, the jealousy, all these things are just eating you up. And you don't know that spiritually, emotionally, it's killing you. You're dying a slow death. And the enemy wants you to stay offended. He wants you to be in unforgiveness. He wants you to be twisted up. He wants you to be mad. But you put a nice face on the outside. I'm here to tell you, God wants a rotor to you. Amen? He's good at rotor rooter. Anyways, I want you to realize, he says, take your censer. Put incense in it. Now, that incense is important. It's that... It's an ingredient that goes in there that once the fire goes on, you know, you begin to have that what's called a sweet-smelling aroma that pleases God. That's where we begin to worship God. We begin to praise God. We begin to intercede. And that's the preparation. And he says, get the fire from the altar. Say, get the fire from the altar. And he says, hurry. Now, imagine this. You know, I kind of I think of this oftentimes when I, when I come across this passage. He says, hurry. He says, and go to the assembly and make atonement. You know, fix it. Do something. And take that. But the key is having the passion, the fire from the altar, to go and stand with the assembly. And says, because he says, the wrath uh, has come from the Lord. The plague has started. Imagine this. Now, you have to understand. Now, Aaron was not your... I mean, in the natural, he's not your top choice. He's the one that you wouldn't have necessarily selected. I mean, his speed was in reverse. You have to understand, the brother was 100 years old. Like, he wasn't at the top of his game anymore. He hadn't been going to, you know, 24-hour gym for a very, very long time. You know, he hadn't had a trainer, you know, for a long time. You ain't following me on this. It's okay. But I want you to hear. So here is, here is but this is amazing. He's not the one who you would expect. He's not the golden boy with the dreadlocks. You know, he's not the guy who has all the looks, all the suits, has all the things around him. He's just the one who's making himself available. Not only that, he's making himself obedient. Obedience always brings breakthrough. And I want you to realize that here is Aaron. He's a 100-year-old man Aaron. He's the most unlikely kind of Aaron. He's the one who's not the physically fit kind of Aaron. You know, but it's amazing what you can do when you don't have the ability to do what you're asked to do, but in faith you do it anyway. It's just amazing what you can do. Amen? So here's Aaron. And, and, and the last thing you're going to say, uh, Moses says, hurry. So he gets, <laughs> he gets a sensor, and he goes, you know, and he's going like this. Where are you going, Aaron? I'm going to the altar. I said, hurry. I am hurrying. What are you doing? I'm at full speed right now. I'm going. How come you're not going any faster? I'm all out. My throttle is all out. And that's, see, the thing is this. He didn't let his age stop him. Sometimes you all let your age stop you. He didn't let who he was stop him. Why, don't you know who I am, Moses? Don't you know who I am? Bro, we, we, walked through some, we walked through some tough times together. You and I faced Pharaoh together. You and I saw miracles together. See, he was still humble enough to say that Moses was the key man. Moses gave him a direction. He got it out of intercession, and he spoke to Aaron. Dear God, that God would raise up Aaron's in our generation. And he just... And it's amazing what ended up happening. So it says that the plague had started. The grumbling, the dishonoring, the, uh, the opposition, the wrong spirit, the wrong attitude, the criticalness. See, all of these things will hurt the body of Christ. It hurts the cause of Christ. And why is that? Because the enemy's trying to distract you or distract me. And they happen to us. It doesn't make you any less spiritual because they happen. You just can't buy into them. 
It happens to everybody, no matter who you are, no matter how long, no matter what you've accomplished, it won't stop until you decide to stop it. You have to put a stop to offense. I will not live offended. I will not live in unforgiveness to anybody. Listen, I don't care who it is. You might think you have forgiven everybody, and you still have this pocket for some other brother or sister over here. That's it right there. That's where he has you, and he has you until you say, but I can't. No, you can't forgive him in yourself, and you can't let it go in yourself. It takes the power of God. That's where you go to the throne of grace and say, God, today I need your help. I come boldly to this throne of grace to obtain mercy and to find grace to help in the time of need. I can't live out my life without your grace. I can't live out my life without mercy. Mercy. Say mercy. mercy. Say mercy. mercy. Say mercy, for brother and sister. You know, it keeps you back from the things that you do deserve, like judgment. And mercy covers us. And what you want to do is you want to call upon grace, which gives you the things that you and I don't deserve, but we get them anyway because God so loved us. Amen? But it's important that you and I know. That's why you need to understand grace and mercy. We need to be people of grace and mercy, not of judgment and criticism. We don't judge our brothers down the street. We don't judge what they're doing. We don't criticize them. We stay focused on the call of God. My competition is not another church. Your competition is not another believer. It never has been and it never should be. You need to understand we stay focused on the cause of Christ, and we stay focused on the Great Commission, and at the end of the day, we're going to let God sort it all out. The Bible says that you and I are not called to judge another man's servant, so they don't do what we do. You don't judge them. You don't criticize them. You don't point your finger. You don't speak evil, and you don't scorn them like you and I are better because we're not better. We're just doing, going to do our thing. At the end of the day, they work for God. They don't work for me, and they don't work for you. If they don't work for you, you have no right to speak over their lives. All right? And so the thing is this. This is what's going on. Now Moses had the ability to speak to the children of Israel because that was his assignment. So Aaron did as Moses said. I love that. So Aaron did as Moses said. Now Aaron, brother and sister, listen to the humility of this man. Aaron was there at the spring of the sea. He was right next to Moses. He was there for every one of those plagues and, and, and the ten miracles that people talk about that happened in Egypt. He was right there. I mean, if there were ever there was a person, at least second in command, somebody would have said it was Mo, it would have been Aaron. You know, and you know, Aaron, you know how you get some people, they get overly familiar with leadership. They say, can't you send somebody else? But God didn't tell me to send somebody else. They get troubled because when something doesn't go their way, when they didn't get the call, when they didn't get position, when they didn't get the opportunity, then they get an attitude. What are you doing that for? It's amazing what God does to test our hearts to see if we're sensitive enough to even know that we're being tested. Not testing doesn't hurt us. It just exposes us. Oh, I love this holy house. Anyways, it says, and so Aaron did as Moses said and ran into the midst of of the assembly. He ran where? Right in the middle. Think about it. God wants you to run into the midst of the assembly. The assembly will not necessarily be the church per se, but I'm talking about run, run right into the middle of the mess. God wants us right in the middle of the mess. Say the mess. Right in the middle. Remember when God called Ezekiel out right in the middle and he was talking about Israel and said, this is a valley of dry bones. It wasn't literal bones. It was the nation of Israel who had lost their heart for God. And he said, I, I, and he put him right in the midst of the dry bones. And I'm prophesying that you and I will see that where God has put Word of Life Christian Center, right in the middle, and every pastor in any city can take this, but put us right in the middle of the dry bones. And it doesn't look like much when you look around yourself, but if you look with God's eyes and look with eyes of faith, you'll begin to see an exceedingly great army come out of those dry bones. And you got to do what God said do. you got to begin to prophesy and speak to those dry bones and call those dry bones out in the name of Jesus. And those dry bones, they are the way they are. Some of them have turned away from God for reasons. Others have failed so badly. 
They destroyed. They walked on so many landmines. They don't even have body parts anymore. But I'm here to tell you that God, in that story, God puts all the body parts together. And I want you to realize, like in real life, some people have just stepped and self-exploded on everything. But I'm here to tell you, and that's a great, great an analogy there, that God wants to put those parts of your life that you think are so far destroyed. And God begins to tell uh, this Ezekiel, he says, begin to prophesy, son. Prophesy to the four winds. I prophesy to the four winds over the state of Hawaii. I prophesy to the four winds over the, uh, the, the great nation of America. And I begin to take up the mantle and the assignment that God gave Jeremiah as he gave it to you and I together, church. Not just pastor art, but together. Together we take up that mantle. We know that we were born for such a time as this. And the, the Bible says that when uh, Jeremiah was standing there he says but I'm too young I'm too young and he wasn't talking about his age because he wasn't a teenage boy he was too young in terms of experience uh, it could have been aged a little bit but in terms of experience and God had called him to prophesy God had called him to speak and he says I have given you an assignment over nations and over kingdoms. See, you and I have authority over the kingdom of darkness, but we also have the ability to build the kingdom of God. And this nation in which you live, you got to cover your nation. You pray for your president. You pray for those in authority. You don't pray from political vantage. You pray from a biblical vantage, and you pray for your president as you would. This is our nation, and there's never been a man or a woman that's been perfect. And if the church begins to get critical, and dogmatic about their viewpoints, they become unbiblical, and they become ineffective. And that's not who we're going to be. But the assignment is taken up by Jeremiah, and the assignment, I want you to receive it right now, the assignment is taken up by Jeremiah, and God says to him, I have assigned you, and I will touch your mouth, and you will speak what I give you to speak, and you will, you will root up, you will tear down, you will destroy, you will overthrow the principalities and powers and rulers of darkness, and you will build and you will plant. You will build and you will plant. We will build the church and we'll plant more churches. We'll build the church and we'll plant more life groups and more life groups because the gospel has got to go to the north, east, south, and west. Can someone get excited about the kingdom of God? And some of you don't even realize your Moses has spoken to you. Your Moses has talked to you already. And he says, it's time to get built up. It's time to realize that we're in a season where God is restoring the great commission through the G12 vision. This is a vision, brother and sister. And you got to realize why Ezekiel was put right in the middle of those dry bones. He was put in the middle of those dry bones because heaven heard that very people. They were walking away from God and what they were saying every day of their lives. And it's written down in the scriptures of, the, of uh, chapter 37. It says they're saying that there is no life in them. They're saying that they have no hope in them. And they're saying that they're empty or they have no supply. So what I began to prophesy is every camp is the Word Life Christian Center. And every time I come to this altar, and every time we have a life group, and every time we have the opportunity, the honor to preach the Word of God, every word that comes out is going to feed people with life. It's going to give them hope and the supply of the Holy Ghost. And that's what we begin to prophesy. And we begin to speak the Word of God. And we begin to speak speak over our city. I don't care what's going on. I don't care how corrupt it is. I don't care what kind of idol worship is going on. Those idols are coming down. Witchcraft is coming down. Principalities and powers are coming down because this is a generation of God's church and God's raising up an exceedingly great army. You aren't hearing what I'm saying, but I'm talking about you today. God's trying to raise you up from just wandering around aimlessly. He's trying to raise you up to become that man, that woman of God that will make a difference on this planet. He's trying to get you stirred up on the inside. He says the only way you're ever going to do that is if you go to the altar and you get the fire and you stand between the people. And the Bible says right here in verse, what is it, verse 48, and he stood between the living and the dead. And Aaron stood between the living and the dead and the plague stopped. You know, this gives you insight, brother and sister. You who have disqualified yourself. What I mean by that is not that God took you out and not the devil took you out. You took yourself out. You don't qualify yourself because you say, I'm not ready. But you are ready. But this is the way you're thinking. I'm not saying you're disqualified. I'm just simply saying you don't really believe it. You have to step into the grace of God to do anything he's called you to do. See, some of you, 
might have been stripped of some things because you were so dependent on your talent, so dependent on your own ability, so dependent on yourself. You really never really were dependent on the Holy Spirit. But the hour has come where God says, if I'm going to get done what I need to get done on this planet, it's got to be through my spirit, not through your flesh. That's why you don't give in to the flesh. You rise up. You might have to wrestle with that thing a little bit. You might have to bring that piece of what point under control a little bit. But I'm here to tell you, you're going to rise up by the spirit of a living. In God, we are going to conquer, and in our time, and with a breath that God has given us, we're going to make a difference on this island. We're going to make a difference in this nation. We're going to make a difference. I see a generation rising up. I see them rising up. Some of our best leaders in the body of Christ are walking the streets right now. Some of them right now might be addicted and twisted and messed up and tore up and aimless. But I'm telling you, when the breath of God comes into them, like the breath of God came into you, there's resurrection power that happens and something begins to stir on the inside of them and they can't stay still anymore. They say, I, I'm not satisfied with that carnal life. I'm not satisfied with that, that old wicked man. i got to move away from that. And that's the Spirit of God taking you and rebuilding something on the inside of you, something that you you never saw, but he saw it even before you were born. He said, before you even came into being, I already had you formed. And some of you can't see it. You're trying to figure that out with your mind. But God already, God already commanded the fact that you be a prosperous person, be a difference maker, make a difference in the time frame that you were born. You're not a mistake. Your mistakes cannot hold you back. God is holding you up. It's now time for you and I to step out and step in to everything that God has for us. Somebody get excited. Let's all stand to our feet. Amen. Y'all get me excited. I want to go to 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And that's just for my introduction. So te mandras y dimos so home. Oh, that feels good, doesn't it? Se le mandras. Just lift up your hands if you would right now. You know, some of us, some of us just have to look at the simplicity of this story. A lot was said, I know. Why don't you close your eyes for a moment and take that sensor of yours, your heart. And I want you to ask God to set a fire within you. Do something that you cannot do, because we all, including myself. You know, when you're, when you're walking this thing out, and learning to grow in spiritual matters, it's a little messy at first. Every step isn't perfect. There's not, not such thing as perfection. Be led by the Spirit of God. Just the fact that you're taking a step forward, for some of us in this room, is massive. And God is so pleased. It's like that sweet-smelling aroma. It's like the incense that flows up from your sensor, your heart. And just the fact that you would be willing to take a step forward and say, God, here I am. I know where I've been and others know where I've been, and, but I know greater where I've been. I know the secrets I've kept. I know the things that I've done. Lord, but if you can do anything with this life, here it is. Maybe it's not even a big leap, a big step. It's just a small step. But I need you to ask God, as part of your prayer, that He set that fire inside of you. Because your altar is not physically this altar, though it can be, but in one sense it really is your quality decision. And I want you to make that quality decision right now as Salani leads us in this song, just a portion of it. Because God wants to show himself through you. I know some of you struggle with believing that. I really do. I, I, I know, I don't, I don't condemn that thought. I just know that you do. Because I'm battling with you, brother and sister. That's why we have 24-hour prayer, because I'm battling with you. I want you free from that mindset that has hold you back. Either that you think you're not good enough. You don't really say it. You really try to cover it up with other actions and other, other emotions. But deep down inside, you know that's what you're really wrestling with. Because you don't have your freedom yet. You don't have the fullness of your joy yet. You want it. You so desperately want it. And you deserve it. Because Christ paid the price for it. But you have to ask Him, set a fire in me. Set a fire. So raise up one of your hands gently. And I want them to lead us in this song. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. Set a fire found in my soul that I can't contain. 
that I can't control. I want more of you, God. To you. I want more of you, God. Instead of finding my soul, Sing that song. I can't contain, With eyes that closed. I can't control. Make it your prayer. I want more of you, God. Ask him. I want more of you, God. Instead of finding you, my, my soul, soul, that I can't contain. We lift our voices to you. We want that fire, Lord God. We're asking you openly in a transparent way. Some of us, Father God, with quiet voices, Lord God, but we're speaking now, Lord. We're lifting up our voice to say, Lord, we need that fire of the Holy Spirit. And so, Father, we take symbolically in our hand, Father God, the sensor of our life, our heart, which makes all the difference in our world. It makes all the difference with anything and everything you've ever assigned us to do. Lord God, we've sometimes put ourselves in, in other arenas and got caught up with distractions and allowed ourselves to run down this vein and run down this vein. But we come back to our first love today. We come back to you, Lord, and we humbly come before your throne and we lift up the censer of our heart and we say, Father, it's our heart that needs your passion. It's our heart that needs your touch. It's our heart that needs that breath that will burn out the crud on the inside. That is not even sin, just the crud, Lord God, that we've allowed to come in there. The jealousies and the envies and the little things that, Lord, seem like the little foxes that have spoiled the vine in our lives. And we come before you and we humble ourselves. And Lord God, it takes everything within us to come boldly to this throne of grace. Our only boldness is in the name of Jesus, but yet we come humbly before you. Father God, because we know that without your mercy and without your grace, we can't accomplish anything that we as a church or anything that we as individuals or as a family can ever do on our own. It never has been about us, but some of us, Lord, including myself, have been times and moments that have made it too much about me. And Father God, today we just come before you and we say, Lord, here we are. We are hungry, Lord God, and we are so thirsty, Father. And we want you to burn on the inside of us in such a way, Lord God, that, Father God, we will be an example, an example to a world that is looking, Father God, for a light, that's looking, Father God, for that city on a hill, that's looking, Father God, for the, for the salt of the earth and the light to the world. And Father God, you don't want us to hide our lamp under a bushel. You want us to put it so everyone can see it. And so, Father God, we don't know how you could do it, some of us in our own experiences have never been able to figure that out. But here we are, Lord. We're taking that, that small but simple step of saying, God, use my life. Burn for me, Lord God. Cause my love to become a flame. Father God, a fire. And cause my life to become a flame. Lord, cause what only you can do to take place in me for your glory, Father God. I want you to lift up your hands right now. And I want us to sing this song and go through this song. And I want you to make this also your prayer, if you would, please. I want you to begin to talk to him for a moment. Say, Lord, do this. Do this right now. We are your burning ones. We are consumed by you. 
We set our lives apart. We set our we just come before you right now with hands lifted up and Lord we're asking you to do a work on the inside of us it cannot be done by our own self we know but Lord we come humbly before you asking you to do a work father a powerful work in our lives Lord that we would see everyone differently that you would burn out whatever it is that needs to be burned out and only you would reveal that to us Lord whether it's criticism or judgments or viewpoints or perceptions on any level any level whatever we have allowed to creep in and cloud our hearts today we just come before you become transparent before you and say God we want to move forward with you father we want to walk in agreement with you your word says how can two walk together lest they be in agreement and so father we want to rid ourselves of all things and in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth father we're thanking you once again Lord God, that you've already ordained us. Father God, the DNA of blessing and multiplication are on your people right now. I thank you, Father God, there's a fire that's going to burn with a revelation, Father God, of who they are. And Father, you said, if any man be in Christ, he is Abraham's seed and heir according to the promise. And you said, Father God, that blessing you will bless us. And multiplying you will multiply us like the stars of the heavens and the sand of the sea shall we obtain and possess the gates of the enemy. Lord, in Jesus' name, we lift up one of our hands and we thank you, Lord God that Jesus Christ is Lord over Hawaii. We take authority over all principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. Father, we decree that no principality or power, Father God, will rule over the church, will rule over this state as long as you have an intercessor that stands, Father God, washed in the blood and speaks in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth and Father God is unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I pray that you would birth a fire inside Father God your family your church Lord God Father, a fire that you've designed. We offer up our censor and we pray for our state and we pray, Father God, that revival shall happen in the name of Jesus. We see and prophesy of a blood-washed Hawaii. Father God, we're thanking you today as we declare salvation shall come. Lord God, opportunities for us to speak will be in the wisdom of God, in the counsel of God, and in the power of God. Lord, we're thanking you today in Jesus' name. They're coming in from the north, the east, the south and the west they're coming in they're coming back they're staying in and they're not going back to the world father god today we're prophesying as ezekiel did over this great state we see father god an exceeding great army father god they may be our family they may be our friends they may be our co-workers but we're prophesying over them and by the breath of the living god to the four corners of this state and we're saying father there's a fire that's burning and a breath that's come to these islands lord god 
We want to thank you, Lord God, that we speak boldly. We are a voice for those who are voiceless. We have a sound for those who have no sound. Father God, we speak up for those who have been silent and where injustice by the adversary has dominated their lives. We thank you that we have authority to break the power of the enemy. And Father God, we prophesy that families will be restored. We prophesy that people will be restored. We prophesy, Lord God, that you're rebuilding lives in Jesus' mighty name. Let that fire burn on the end inside of us father god let it burn on the inside of every believer lord god visit them in their midnight hour father god until they wrestle with you and say yes i need your blessing god i need that fire i'm tired of compromising i'm tired of my secrets i'm tired of doing things under the table i'm going to live openly i'm going to live humbly i'm going to live powerfully in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. We lift up our hands and say thank you God for your grace and mercy. We prophesy grace and mercy over this entire island. Over this entire island. Mercy over Hawaii. Mercy over Hawaii. Mercy over every city. Mercy over Maui. Mercy over Kona. Mercy over Oahu Father God. The gathering place Lord. In the name of Jesus we prophesy. We speak with authority. We speak to the heavenlies. We call the angels of God from the north North, east, south, and west to assist us, Lord God, because they've come to assist those who are heirs of salvation. Lord God, right now we're shifting things in the realm of the Spirit. Lord God, we're causing the heavenlies to tremble. Father God, for righteousness, as we continue to prophesy and lift up the voice once again and declare that the life of this land is perpetuated in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. And everyone said, Amen and Amen. Come on, put your hands together.